everybody. Welcome to another episode of Jukebox Zero's home of Big Fat Chungus. Still, we got the Chungus. That's great. I yeah. love this partnership. We uh, have a monopoly. All behind it. We have a monopoly on this stupid internet meme. Yep, absolutely. We own it now. Sorry. Yep. We didn't pay for it, but we... Nope, no backsies. Nope, absolutely not. We bartered uh, with the great internet uh, barterer. So quite a bit has happened since uh, the recording of our last episode. Uh, the RPM challenge went, uh, came and went. And I took a trip to Troy, New York, and uh, it's a dump. <laughs> oh, yeah. That, that's pretty much what I've heard, too. Uh, it's a bit of a dump. Yeah. Uh, what's it smell like? Um, uh, moist. Cool. Cool. Thoroughly disturbed. Thank yep. you. <laughs> <laughs> so Very anyway, uh, we got like a bit of a hard out today, so we're just going to start blazing through stuff, uh, starting with uh, our little apologies section. It's time for the apologies. <laughs> I'm sorry, baby. I didn't mean it, baby. Anyway, uh, you got anything to apologize for, Pat? Nope. <laughs> um, I apologize for in the last episode, I realized that I didn't say what my favorite song off of the Leonard Cohen album was, which was True Love ne- Leaves No Traces. So uh, uh, go go ahead and update that. Jukebox Zero's wiki, pig, wiki article, people. Oh, yeah. We got a juke juke spot. Yeah. Wiki <laughs> box heroes. No, this isn't going to work. Yes. This Up- really isn't going to work. Update the fan page on Wikia. All right. I apologize for what that last segment. <laughs> yeah. And let's quickly blaze through our second segment, which is Chicago, Whitney Houston, or Celine Dion. It was Celine Dion, at least for me. What? That's nuts. I mean, why is that nuts? Because it's been Chicago for the past, like, three months. <laughs> I mean, I think there's something wrong with the speakers downstairs because it was super, super quiet, but it was unmistakably that kind of yarling voice of Celine Dion. That's the best way to she's enjoy got that Celine kind Dion. Of, she's got that kind of very share quality of just where she's just like, kind of thing. Yeah. That always sounded like a very tuneful goose it, to me. I, I suppose so. I mean, she is from Canada, and there's a lot of geese up in Canada. That's so true. Amazing. I mean, maybe it's different from our guest who just popped in, so why don't we introduce her? Uh, that's right. I mean, she's not a goose, uh, but she does play bass for uh, for the dick pics uh, <laughs> and also the knockups, and also now just joined the Salem Wolves, a uh, local sort of bluesy hard rock band uh, from Boston. Her name is Kat Verlico. Hello. Oh my god, you got my name right. Did I and I said it correctly? You really did, good. yeah. Awesome. Like nobody gets that right. Yeah. Mm. I, I try. I try to uh try to remember last names when I can. Uh at least pronunciations. Yeah. So did you happen to catch what was playing downstairs when you were coming up uh the elevator? Actually no, I guess I didn't pay attention. What was it? Oh, I, I can't answer that for you. Okay. All right. I'll have no, the to idea is that up. you came up at a separate time, so there must have been a different yeah. song play. Because uh-huh. the, play, oh. the playlist in Pat's building seems to only exclusively have songs by Chicago, Whitney Houston, and, and Celine Dion. that was the game that you were just playing. Pretty I much. see. Okay. Yeah. Now it all makes right. sense. Yeah, we do a lot of nonsensical things it's here. Great. Right? Yeah. We have- it covers up the fact that we have no journalistic scruples whatsoever. <laughs> yeah. Definitely. So what are we doing today? We're... Uh, we're covering an album um, yep. of sorts. I think before we uh, start covering that album, I think it's very important that we get to the question that I'm sure is on everybody's mind. Did you bring any Salem Wolves beer? Oh, <laughs> man. I, I don't even have any in my my fridge at home, to be honest. It goes quick, but it's still on tap. Cat is in a band who has their own beer. I sure That's am. And pretty it, amazing. It's tasty. It really is. Um, what is it, it? You can tell us. It's an IPA. And what's the brand again? Um, it's Down the Road Brewing Company. Awesome. And it's still on tap there, which is pretty cool. I, I should pick more up myself, you know. That's it's, right. It's my beer, but. My All right, come beer. and sponsor us, guys. <laughs> we, we plugged you. Yes. That's Hasht- right. Hashtag beer. beer. Hashtag beer. Perfect. <laughs> That'll get people's attention. Absolutely. I mean, everybody. everybody's looking at the hashtag for beer. They, yeah. They're keeping up on the updates. That's right. So what do you say we start banging out this album real quick? Ooh, yeah. It's it's right. It's due. So all too frequently when I do these contextual essays, I run the risk of sounding like a dippy boomer rock journalist writing for Rolling Stone or more interested in marketing speak than music history. That being said, the Red Hot Chili Peppers. 
One of the most successful and influential alt-rock groups of their times, Red Hot Chili Peppers' fusion of punk, psychedelia, jam music, and most notably funk, was unheard of when they hit the scene in the 1980s. Uh, their sound at their commercial peak was grounded by Anthony Kiedis on vocals, who laid the groundwork for the development of funk metal, rap metal, and new metal. Uh, Michael Balzeri, best known by the stage name Flea, who had a P-Funk inspired bass technique, and the psychedelic virtuosic playstyle of John Frusciante, who emphasized emotion and melody over overt technicality. And also Chad Smith was there. He sure was, and he, he's doing his best. I just want to make that clear, I'm not trying to denigrate all the other incredibly talented musicians that were part of the band, but for the purposes of this episode, we're focusing on this specific group of people. Anyway, after years of critical acclaim, but just under the radar of commercial success, the Peppers hit it big when they signed to Warner Brothers and hooked up with Rick Rubin to record what would be their fifth studio album, the uber-successful Blood Sugar Sex Magic, which included all kinds of Billboard Hot 100 charters, including Under the Bridge and Give It Away, and is to this day considered one of the greatest albums of all time by publications like Q, Spin, Rolling Stone, and of course it sold a shit ton. Like, I think it reached like seven times platinum sales. Despite Blood Sugar Sex Magic sale success, however, Red Hot Chili Peppers themselves were starting to come apart. The sudden pop success of the record did not sh sit well with uh, John Frusciante, who preferred the Peppers to stay an underground phenomenon. This came to a head during the Blood Sugar Sex Magic tour, during which Frusciante fell deeper and deeper into depression, and until minutes before a 1992 show in Tokyo, he announced that he had quit, and would not go on stage before like... like a half hour's worth of negotiating. Guitarist Eric Marshall was called in to finish the last stretch of the tour, and Frusciante would not return to the group until 1998. At the tour's end, the Peppers regrouped to begin recording a new album with Rick Rubin, recruiting Jane's Addiction guitarist Dave Navarro to fill Frusciante's shoes. Navarro proved to be a very difficult addition to the band as he took exception to the Peppers' songwriting process, which heavily emphasized jamming, which Navarro was uncomfortable with. And on top of this, at the as time went by, Anthony Kiedis slipped into narcotic use after having been sober for five years. This drug usage would uh, color the sound and the mood of the ensuing record, 1995's One Hot Minute, which featured darker and much more insular songwriting from Kiedis, as well as sound cues taken from psychedelic rock, heavy metal, and gothic rock courtesy of Navarro, who was not versed in funk music like the rest of the band. One Hot Minute was released to mixed opinion, with the general consensus being that it was an inferior follow-up to Blood Sugar Sex Magic. It still managed to reach double platinum sales and generated three Billboard charting sequels, not sequels, Billboard, <laughs> Billboard charting singles, but was a far cry from the predecessor, or sequel, it was a far cry commercially and crit critically from its sequel, predecessor. <clears throat> Our total bestie, Stephen Thomas Erlewine of All Music, gave the album 2.5 stars, stating that it provides the fewest thrills of any of the group's albums. Well, uh, Ali Lorraine, writing for the LA Times, gave it two stars, singling out Kiedis in particular, saying, uh, His affected voice is downright embarrassing when he shouts things like, Hey girl, with a faux street savvy. And no matter what persona he takes on, sensitive ballad singer, cool funkster, or anxious ex-punkster, he's always unbelievable. On the other hand, outlets like Pop Matters, Consequence of Sound, and Loudwire have dubbed it an underrated and unsung gem of the Peppers catalog. Andrew Doskis of Pop Matters declared the record, declared of the record, uh, One Hot Minute is a sad album and ultimately that's why it's scorned, but it's a successful sad album that summed up where the band was at this point. Would you like to hear what we think about it? Too bad, you're already in too deep. <laughs> it's time for us to listen to One Hot Minute by the Red Hot Chili Peppers. That's the risk you take when you pre uh, press play. Mm on your iTunes podcast that's, player. That's why you signed the NDA. That's exactly <laughs> what we do. So before we get into it, um, prior to listening to this album, I have not, prior to, prior to this episode, I have not heard this album. But from what I understand, you guys both have. Yes. That is correct. Very much. And were, were you guys particular fans of it before this episode? I guess my introduction to Red, uh, to One Hot Minute was Aeroplane. Uh, it's obviously like, one of the most iconic slap bass lines, or, you know, of the, mm, at least of sure. the 90s, you know? Yeah, and it was a huge single for them. Yeah, it was. I, actually, let's go back even further. Like, what do you guys think of Red Hot Chili Peppers on the whole? Okay, I'll start. <clears throat> go for it. <laughs> um, so, I guess I can't deny them. You know, Flea is um, hands down, like, my biggest slap influence. I, uh, I've been playing his stuff ever since I was in high school. And um, so... 
I, there's always going to be that special place in my heart for the Red Hot Chili Peppers. They do get a lot of criticism, and it's like, you know, obviously warranted. <laughs> and um, uh, I just think, regardless, I'll always have that that like, oh my god, but the bass, the yeah. bass, you know, that's why I'm here. Hmm. <laughs> yeah, I I would uh, kind of piggyback on that. Uh, I was, you know, my, my brother was really into them and he had blood sugar sex magic uh, mm. when I was growing up. And h- him and my sister were, were you know, very big uh, in showing me music early on, uh, being the youngest. So, like, you know, being like 10 years old, 10, 11 years old, and being exposed to this stuff. And uh, this record came out, One Hot Minute came out, like, when I was really starting to you know, assert myself as someone listening to listening to rock music and like being a fucking consumer of music or whatever. Uh, so I just there, there's a, a strong nostalgic tie to this particular album in in uh, in general just because of that. Alone. A couple of things too um, with this this album. I think this is a perfect example of a pothead bass player given too much power. Right. You That's know? true. <laughs> I think that pretty much sums up oh, one yeah. hot minute for me. Hmm. I have a I have a feeling we'll be getting further into it as we get into the tracks. Definitely. Personally for me, red hot chili peppers have always just been kind of like, yes, they're there. Like That's fair. my favorite red hot chili peppers album is By the Way, which is probably one of their less red hot chili peppers y sounding albums. Yeah. So, you know, take my opinions on them for whatever. Right. I think they're I mean, I think they're more dynamic than than people the, the you know harsher critics would would give them credit for. I think they, you know, they put out a lot of stuff. Uh, but for me, I, I can find at least one or two songs on all of their albums that I, I can find enjoyable. Even mm. Stadium Arcadium. <laughs> Believe Ooh, it or that's not. That's a hot take. But I mean, there's mm-hmm. fucking 28 songs on there. Like yeah. one of them is, you know, just one by, of the fillers. Yeah, just yeah. by mm. like uh, permutation or, or what you would uh, pro- uh, forget it. I suck at math. <laughs> let's go into this album. Right. <laughs> let's uh, let's jump in uh, right off the bat. Here's track number one, titled "Warped." <laughs> First single off the album didn't manage to reach the Hot 100 like their previous lead-off single, but did chart at number 7 on the Alternative Songs charts and number 13 of, on the Mainstream Rock chart. So, first impression of this song, based wholly on our impressions of the Red Hot Chili Peppers sound up to this point, this doesn't sound all that much like a Red Hot Chili Peppers song to me. I mean, they would branch out in their song over the years, but up to this point the band has primarily been about sounding really funky and with occasional moments of introspection, but I don't get that from this track. To me, it sounds like a Jane's Addiction track. That's I mean, fair. That's almost certainly because of Dave Navarro's contributions, <laughs> yeah. but and I get the feeling that's just going to be a recurring motif throughout the album. But, I mean, actually it's not wholly accurate, because if anything it sounds better than Jane's Addiction to me because <laughs> Perry Farrell's not on it. That's that's very yeah. true. Uh, so, I it's funny we said that that this song didn't really uh, crack the the charts that much because I remember it being featured. The video for it was on MTV like all the time um, mm. in late '95, early '96, which was kind of when I was starting to watch a lot of that. I don't shit. even think I've seen the video for that one. Yeah, uh, it, it's like. It's really sweet. It's fucking S and M, B S. Yep. S D D D. A little bit of controversy around that video. <laughs> um, it ran into a spat of controversy when it was circulating because the music video featured a kiss between Kiedis and Navarro, as well as other homoerotic imagery. Oh, that's right. That's what it was. You know, the nineties. Yeah. <laughs> Warner Brothers wanted the video disposed of immediately, but the band kept the imagery in and actually lost a chunk of their more conservative segments of their fan base because of it. To which Kiedis responded in an interview, if they couldn't accept what we were doing, we didn't need them anymore. So them That's going out cool. them going so out on stage them. with yeah. uh, them going out on stage with socks on their dicks, like or that less. didn't sway them away. Or less. Yeah. <laughs> a yeah. really shredded up sock. <laughs> well Flea actually I think played a whole festival like naked. Yeah, yeah, I think I think they did that at like Woodstock ninety four or something. Something like too. that, yeah. I would not I would not be surprised by that. Yeah. It's gotta hurt. 
Oh, you're Vangus. <laughs> yeah, that's yeah. probably true. You just have the base just sort of like whapping up against that all the time. Yeah. And sweat. And they, they jump around like all over the place. They so sure do. I'd be afraid of they're slipping. Always, they're always I'd be afraid of slipping. Yeah, yeah, that's for sure. Slapping yeah. the wrong things. But as for the track itself, it's pretty good. As I mentioned, I haven't been that much of a fan of when the peppers go in on, you know, on Double Down and all the funky jams, so... There's a lot of psychedelia to this album, I think, too. Yeah, that's true. And I don't know how I feel about that aspect. That mixed with funk in this context, I don't know if it works the best. Hmm. Yeah, I, I kind of appreciated that edge to, to this album. It, it, it sort of... it's. It gives you a, a sense of the world that these guys are in right now, uh, you know, where it's very right. druggy and hazy and, and like sort of half reflective of what's going on, but also kind of delusional at the same time. I, I really like this track. Uh, mm. I'm, I'm going to say right up front, this is probably my favorite Red Hot Chili Pepper song uh, out of like their whole catalog. Wow. What? Yeah. Wow. Hot take. Yeah. Hot take from Hot Minute. So yeah, and I, I, there's there, there are things that I that I really appreciate what they were doing, uh, and, and it's like little things here and there. Uh, it's funny because Anthony Kiedis is like really flat on a lot of the vocals on this oh, album. Actually, uh, we'll get to P in a minute, but P is flea and it's really it's bad. Yeah, it's yeah, holy crap. Now there, there's a spoiler alert. Yes. Oh geez. <laughs> it hurts. Uh, <laughs> And it's funny. It's funny you mention Anthony Kiedis because some one one thing I was gonna say. I mean, I didn't really hear like the flatness so much, but the lyrics have a tendency to switch between either being painfully surface level stuff, yes, or just the most you know out there pseudo spiritual bullshit. Yeah, there's that you a get lot from, of like, that. a crystal shop in Salem or yeah. something like that. <laughs> I mean, that's just always been his problem. Uh, the whole time. Yeah, yeah, that's that's the risk you run when you go with Red Hot Chili Peppers, who historically write about maybe three or four different things. He's mm. definitely a caveman. That's how I see Kitas. Yeah, that's a that's a fair assessment. That's that that's definitely fair. Uh, but what I really I, I dig a lot of things about like the production on this track. Like uh, there, he's doing this sort of like not quite in time vocal run, uh, but like put through these time delays. I, I always thought that was like really interesting. Um, Do you think uh, that was a Rick Rubin decision? I would I would have to assume so. Hmm. Back when, but back when he actually made decisions and didn't just like show I, up and I know, fart. Because I because <laughs> I know from uh, your pod your other podcast, Old Ben Yell at Cloud, you have kind of a you have beef with Rick Rubin. We have opinions. <laughs> we have opinions with all with with all musicians and producers because you know it's just us asserting our own insecurities. <laughs> Fair enough. Uh, Fair I mean enough. that's that's all I have to say. Uh, yeah, it, I I really like this song. Yeah, I think it's a pretty good song, too. I don't know if I'd call it my favorite, but not bad. Not a bad start. So let's move on to track number two, this one featuring the big single from the album, number two, titled Aeroplane. I like there's a spike with pain and music is my aeroplane. It's my aeroplane. Song of sweet and sour chain and music is my aeroplane. It's my aeroplane. Third single from the album, likely the one people remember the most. It's the only single from one hot minute which reached the mainstream top 40, uh, charting at number 30 while also landing at number 12 on the mainstream rock charts and number 8 on the alternative charts. Uh, just off the bat, I will say it's kind of hard for me to take Aeroplane seriously sometimes. Not because of the band's fault, though there is something very silly related to the song that we'll get into later. Um... Funnily enough, it's because of Monty Python. Okay. There is a sketch, like one of my favorite sketches is basically, um, basically you have Terry Jones going into like just sort of an academy type place to learn how to fly what he thinks he's going to learn how to fly an airplane. And then he gets in there and Graham Chapman is just sort of hanging on a wire acting like he's flying. <laughs> and at one point, Terry Jones just like says angrily, I came here to learn how to fly an aeroplane. And Graham Chapman goes, oh, an aeroplane. No more buttered scones for me, Mater. I'm off to play the grand piano and go fly my aeroplane. <laughs> And so that's the image in your head. Yes, every time I even hear the word <laughs> aeroplane. That's great. So this feels a little more in tune with like the Pepper sound that people were familiar with at the time. Kiedis is sing-rapping like he used to do, uh, Flea engaging in a little bit of slap at a bass. 
even Navarro's putting a little bit of effort to make his guitar sound like, you know, in a funky style. Right. Yeah. Well, he switched back to the, the clean tone and like doing the more kind of rhythmic uh, funk style guitar versus his like his sort of all rock right. crunch that he does. Which was know. kind of Frusciante's wheelhouse at the time. Yeah. Exactly. Uh, well, one thing I'm going to say uh, is it, it's kind of interesting that the, the tone of this record with, with <coughs> the heavier guitars versus uh, Blood Sugar Sex Magic was, you know, John Frusciante playing a Jaguar in like, you know, super clean tones, a lot of, uh, uh, you know, bridge pickups, super clean, pearly tone and like not really a ton of distorted guitar or like, you know, maybe at most it was like heavily compressed in a way that it just had a little more bite to it. But if you go back to Mother's Milk, which was the record that came out before it to say, yes, like there was a ton of like heavy guitar on that album there you know he was doing palm muting and i think there's like more of yeah they were trying to push that like metal meets funk thing a lot more at that point and then yeah. he, he totally scaled back and <clears throat> yeah and Frusciante would obviously when he came back with californication and by the way he was using a lot of clean tones still so yeah it's just kind of interesting that they that they kind of went back to that on this record with a different guitarist was that albeit. was that the first uh, record that Frusciante played on with them mother's milk yes so do you think maybe there was like sort of a thing of just like we need you to try to sound like our previous guitarist Hillel Slovak couple things um i think first of all i know Frusciante had a strat to piggyback on what you were saying yeah. that um was i think he took one of his pickups and reversed it he flipped it upside down to sound more like hendrix because you know how yeah. hendrix would play a righty but upside down right. so in order to cop that tone he flipped his pickups which i thought was really cool that's really interesting and then there were some moments on mother's sorry to go back but there were some moments on mother's milk that I thought sounded like what would become tracks like Scar Tissue and Californication. There were like hmm. some moments there, and it was kind of telling. And then to go back to your question, which now I'm like losing. maybe they were trying to just sort of just sort of drive into Frusciante. We need you to try. We have a specific song. We have a specific sound that we had with Hillel oh, Slovak. With Hillel. And we kind of need you to try to replicate that because this is our sound. This is what we want to go with. There might have been a little bit of that, I like purely speculating, you know, hmm. that I think that might be possible. But I do think it's hard to keep up with a, such a busy bass player and to find That's probably what, true, yeah. what yeah. works over somebody who's just constantly going and, and is super loud and super big. And, and also with the slapping, like his, he's in a different register when he slaps. So those are all things that you kind of have to dance around, I would right. think. And there's only so much dancing around somebody could do yeah that's true yeah you're sort of like uh you're, you're sort of cross-feeding that dynamic with, with uh you know the bass player might be doing some lead stuff and the guitar switches over to do lower rhythm stuff uh so uh yeah you said you're a big fan of the song right this is um probably my favorite red hot chili pepper song ever cool um i remember when i first started playing bass in my first band in high school um, we had this guitar player, and everyone was like, oh, but he's actually a really good bass player. He plays a lot of Red Hot Chili Pepper stuff. And that was the moment when I was like, I want to sound like that guy. And it all started from there. And I didn't really have a lot of knowledge of them until that moment. And then from there, everything was like slap bass. That's mm, the yeah. coolest thing. <laughs> and I will say... Uh, I'm not a huge fan of, of Flea's bass tone typically, but... For some reason, on this song, like it, it's it's EQ'd in a really nice, like scooped way, and and, and like it, like you I feel like it should and, sound, yeah, yeah. You get that like nice, mm -hmm. you know, pop from from the the high end, but like you, you know, still get a, a fair amount of bottom on it. Mm -hmm. yeah, you're probably not gonna like this just because you're such a big fan. It's okay. I don't really dig this song all that much. <laughs> no, that's okay. <laughs> Songwriting quality, I, I get it. It's not, you know. I mean, it's more because of, like, you know, that it's connected to this album. Like, very frequently this album goes to kind of darker, sort of hazier places, and this is sort of sticking out like a bright and sunny sore thumb. Oh, that's so funny. And it just kind of doesn't do it for me that's more cool. than anything. A last thing about this, what makes me really mad is when it used to play on the radio, 
they would cut out the intro, which is a bass solo, and his other second bass solo. This song has two bass solos, and commercially, when they get played, they get cut. Ah, yeah. yeah. It's, what a shame. Yeah, I know. They, yeah, not, not suitable for commercial radio. No bass solos. Nope. You'll, you'll give the children nightmares. <laughs> so quick little bit of trivia before we move on to the next track. Uh, the music video for this song is cited as Kiedis' least favorite one the band has ever done due to how expensive it was. <laughs> If you've ever seen the music video, you might agree. There's a lot of shit going on. Yeah. In it. They're like in a circus tent and there's trapeze artists and everywhere, pool, but there's also a pool full of synchronized swimmers and everything is draped in gold lame, <laughs> all leading up to a chorus of children wearing airplane costumes and doing a weird choreographed dance. <laughs> I don't remember that. Yeah, who, where did they find those children? Good question. Oh. I, I, I mean, have to imagine it's like rec- one of their kids and then like on the his, recording, their classmates. I, on the recording, I think it was the class of... Uh, Fairfax? The, I don't know. Oh, their high school? <laughs> no, I don't think it was... It was like, I don't remember where specifically, but it was like the class of Flea's daughter's uh, kindergarten, I think. Oh, cool. Yeah, so that's fun. I don't know if it's the same people in the, in video, the video or not, but... but they were going to pull yeah. you out of school for this video shoot. Dad, it's it's three of the morning. <laughs> what's that a, little busy school. What's a music video shoot? <laughs> oh, we're just like airplane. Mom, <laughs> Dad is doing weird things again. <laughs> ah, but they're all dead now. Let's move on to track number. <laughs> probably not. Track number three. This one is titled Deep Kick. Two boys in San Francisco, or two boys in San Francisco, laughing up in the bar bathroom. Those coppers woke us up, a motherfucker woke us up. This this is can't stop, right? I can't be the only one thinking that. <laughs> I thought it sounded like warped, actually. <laughs> It, it it sounds like both those songs, and it actually also reminded me of Gang of Four. Uh, oh yeah, what was it called not not Great Men or something like that? It, it's totally praise. pulling some influence from that. Mm, though. Interesting pull. Yeah, but, I mean they're 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 very influenced by Gang of Four. That's they they make that clear. Uh, you know, for street cred, of course. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> it's weird because this this song opens up with some weird Tom Waits style music with narration before going on to just a very standard sounding. Chili Peppers with some bumpy, slappy bass. I am instantly not a fan of the backing vocals. Oh, yeah. Which sound like a creepy goblin cooking up a stew is singing them. Yeah. The, <laughs> uh, who's doing backing vocals on I'm that? I'm going to guess Flea. But it, it has it, to be. It, yeah. Every time the backing vocals aren't great, I assume it's Flea. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not sure what it is about Flea's vocals, but there's never any middle ground. It's always He always sounds like either a backup singer or a weirdo who wandered into the booth. <laughs> maybe maybe that's the whole point, though. But I I'm, don't know. <laughs> and either way, I don't dig it. So that's him doing the vocals on that like interlude towards the end, too. Is it this song? Maybe maybe it's maybe it's another I, song. I don't I don't remember. All right. Well, there's a different. Oh wait, the I remember. Yeah. Yeah. So I think that's actually Kiedis, but I'm not sure. It it doesn't sound like him in like the 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 way it's recorded is very strange because it, it's very dry and it sounds like kind of pushed back in the mix. So I, I was wondering maybe if it, it was one flea. of the other guys. Yeah. Yeah. I'd I'd just say to Flea like you Will know, Ferrell. Stick, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I would I would say to Flea, stick to what you do and stick to what you do best, Flea. Play bass, play trumpet, do a fake German accent in Coen Brothers movies, <laughs> and wear socks in the wrong places. That's very true. <laughs> and like as with typical Chili Peppers songs, Kiedis' lyrics are once again very surface level or yeah. really cutesy in a weird way that's frequently either creepy, dumb, or both. Like like here's a choice example. Climbing out of hostile windows, oh. wearing gear so out but in though. Come on, kid, and do the no no. Don't. <laughs> just, just just don't. don't. Why are don't we not encouraging no-no. kids to do the yes yes? <laughs> <laughs> Which is when yes. you listen to uh, two yes albums back to back. I do that every Sunday. <laughs> All the kids are doing the no-no, which is probably something graphic, when they should be doing the yes-yes, which is coming home at a reasonable hour and being in bed by eight. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and putting on close to the edge and fragile back then. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Have that on while you sleep. And you win a minute That's my John Anderson impression. Uh, so what do we got? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, 
it, I mean, we're kind of in agreement this is an okay song, though, right? It's, like, just okay, and I would say it's filler material. And it's, honestly, when I think of this song and the lyrics, I'm like, oh, cool story, bro. Because it's just them talking about <laughs> yeah. two boys in London, England, or what, you know what I mean? It's just, it, my, are their adventures. There was this one time I climbed out a window. Yeah. Kind of thing yeah, like it, that. Yeah, the, the story just feels like something we've all heard before. But also, if you have read Kiedis' autobiography, it's actually really good. It's I've been like, needing to moly. check it out. Yeah, it's actually really entertaining. Mm. Do they get into this story or? Yes, yeah, some of them. Mm. Yeah, because this is like all meshed together. Yeah. Fair enough. I, I thought the... I, I thought this song was too goddamn long. Uh, and I don't think it needed that intro section. Mm. Uh, yeah. So, yeah, I, it, it definitely took me out of it, the, the sort of, like, different vibes that were happening. And I think just the placement of it on the record was weird, too. Like also, having it at track three. keep in mind, too, I think between um, Blood Sugar Sex Magic and this album was when, I think, when River Phoenix died. So mm. that also fed into Frashanti's addiction problems. Um, Flea was actually at the club that night, the Viper Room, on stage while, oh, yeah, while River was... Um, was like, being kicked out. Was dying. Mm. Yeah. Got that. Yeah. I didn't know that. There's a song yeah. that gets into that much later in the record, oh, too. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, so what do you say we move on to track number four? Mm -hmm. Track number four, titled My Friends. Oof. Oof. I love all of you. Second single off the album reached number one on the Billboard Modern Rock charts. Uh, it would be the only track from One Hot Minute to appear on their 2003 Greatest Hits collection. Also notable for its music video directed by Anton Corbin. Corb I've never been clear how you pronounce it. Yeah, I, I say Corbain, but Corbain. That's probably that's probably correct. I, I think there. I think it's sort of tomato tomato. <laughs> but anyway, music video directed by Anton Corbain, which features the band performing in a boat stranded in the middle of the ocean. Kiedis has remarked in interviews that he didn't like the music video because it wasn't realistic, as opposed to the Dr. Seuss fever dream that was Aeroplane, where the <laughs> only problem was it was too expensive. I mean, he was so fucked up at the time. He was like, I mean, yeah, that's what that's what I'm seeing. Air, just little kids dancing around in airplane <laughs> suits. Yeah, this is just like life. Yeah. Sometimes you're just trying to live your life, and all of a sudden there's children dressed like airplanes. Doing and it's little, so expensive. Doing a jaunty dance. And life is expensive. Yeah. <laughs> how much do you think Dunkaroos uh, factored into, <laughs> like, how, how they were able to, like, get all those kids together on stage? Like, do we really know it was Flea's kids' classmates? Or had, did they just, Dunk like... Had Dunkaroos even been invented by then? I'm not sure Oh, my when. God. 95? We were in... We, it was peak Dunkaroos time. Yeah. Dunkaroos fever. <laughs> Dunkaroos fever. Dunkaroos fever. Yeah. That's very true. You know, there, there's like the British invasion. 1995 was, was the Dunkaroos invasion. <laughs> was the cafeteria snack invasion. That's right. <laughs> Peak time for all, all the greats. All the great celebrities had giant like pools of frosting that they would like. <laughs> they would get in cookie suits and, and jump into. <laughs> so <laughs> I'm hungry. <laughs> <laughs> so in, in yeah, you eat those Pringles. That's right. Pringles sponsor us. Hashtag Pringles. <laughs> But you can't eat one. <laughs> <laughs> so in reviews for this song, a lot of publications basically compared it to trying to copy the success of Blood Sugar Sex Magic tracks, Breaking the Girl and Under the Bridge. And I can kind of see the similarities between these two tracks, and I don't necessarily consider it a bad thing either. Like, of all the singles from One Hat Minute, I think this one might be my favorite. Sometimes the band's efforts to be less funky don't quite land, but in this case, I kind of feel like it does, especially on an album like this, where it's one of the few instances where Navarro's less funk fost <clears throat> Excuse me. Where Navarro's less funk... <laughs> this is <laughs> a hard right. sentence. Why did I write this? <laughs> where Navarro's less funk-focused guitar chops don't feel out of place. And Navarro was aware of that was aware that he was frequently out of place mm -hmm. in an interview with Guitar World, stating of the Pepper's signature brand of funk rock, it doesn't really speak to me, but then again, when I'm playing with three other guys who I love and feel camaraderie with, it's enjoyable to play funk. Yeah, I I would agree that I, I don't I don't hate this song. Um, I, I, I do have kind of a bit of a soft spot for it. Uh, 
That's that kind of ties back it. to uh, when, when it was popular on the radio was, was when I was, you know, you know, really starting to get into like radio rock and, and like asserting myself as someone who is like knowing what new shit was out as an 11 year old or whatever. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I, I, I dig this track. It, it's got some nice chords. It, it's it does its purpose. Mm. Yeah, I think uh, it's very surface level, what very one dimensional, but it's uh, you know you get the point of it, and sentiment is there. That's true. My mm. friends and uh, I don't I don't know the my rest friends. Of the words. I like them. <laughs> they are nice. They're real nice. Friends are nice to have. That just remind me reminded me of uh, <laughs> my my elementary school yearbook. Uh, so I was in fifth grade, and like we had to you know it's like. You have your picture and then like, you know, the blurb about like what you want to be when you grow up, what your favorite food is, and then like what your favorite memory of school was. And I had gotten I had gotten to a fight with my friend Chris, who was like had been my best friend since like first or second grade. <laughs> and I put like put down like a really bitchy uh like blurb at the bottom of that was like, what was your favorite me memory of school? All my friends were really nice. <laughs> <laughs> Do you think maybe that might have gotten lost since you could, since like it was text and you couldn't have it, you wouldn't have gotten like the sarcasm from? Well, it? I put in the the coding, uh, you know, slash sarcasm at the, the end of it too. I was actually one of the first people to do that. <laughs> well, there you go. Then that would do it. I was I was coding before the Lottie was born. <laughs> anyway, anyway, uh, my friends. Yep, my friends. That my is friends. track number four, and we're moving on to track number five, titled uh, "Coffee Shop." Meet me at the coffee shop We can dance like a gay prom Another go in the parking lot A freak to cheek on your hot spot These references can get really dumb sometimes. I actually really like that line. We can <laughs> really? dance like Iggy Pop. Come on. If, if you heard another band say that. You might like it. I think it works. I, I actually, I, I love this song. <laughs> I, I, I just think that's I a do. good line. We can dance like Iggy Pop is a cool line. All right. Maybe I'm just being really mean. But there are some <laughs> No, share, really, share your opinion. There, we need to be shamed. Really, yes. There are some legitimately dumb lines in this song. Oh, of course. Like, uh, Confucius might have been confused and Buddha might have blown a fuse. I ooze the muse. <laughs> what exactly? What? what? Also gross. Also what? Also Stop gross. oozing. <laughs> Please don't ooze. Yeah, you got to get a spray for that. Uh, what is this song about? <laughs> I, I mean, think is it about confused. Dunkin' Donuts? <laughs> I mean, clearly they want to go to a coffee shop. Yeah, I mean, that's and where And dance that's where the in things. the coffee shop? Yeah. Because that... that's what you do? <laughs> I mean, I'm pretty sure it's about doing drugs in a Dunkin' Donuts bathroom, but oh, yeah. I could be mistaken. <laughs> so this was the final single off the album, only seeing release as a single in Germany where it did not manage to chart. <laughs> mm. It's another song more reminiscent of the RHCP that people were used to prior to One Hot Minute, to be sure. Does some really neat aux percussion stuff during the breakdown that takes place midway through, and Flea, you know, I will admit, Flea is crushing it with a slap yeah. bass solo. Totally that brings crushing. the song to a close. Yeah, I, 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 Kiedis is kind of doing some weird stuff in the verses that, like, you know, I don't know, he's trying it, trying some stuff out, and I, I thought it was, like, for the most part, successful, and, like, it's very, it's a very, like, 1995, like, That's Eastern cool. music meets grunge, color by numbers riff, but, like, I, I'm a total sucker for that shit, mm. yeah. so. That's, uh, like, a party song. They play that, yeah. like, at festivals, and people dance. Like, I could get that. Right. Oh, for sure. Uh, and yeah, and like the, I thought the like, some of the like, just like the chord stuff that they were doing in, in the choruses were like pretty interesting. <coughs> and I don't know, Navarro's like he's a solid guitarist. Mm. He, he's he's doing he's doing the things. I think yeah. he looks like a pirate sometimes. You know, he sure I, does. I just don't know if he completely turns me on or off. I don't know. <laughs> I I know what you mean. Yeah, it's, it's like, is he sexy? I don't know. Are you Carmen Electra? <laughs> <laughs> Oh, they were dating for a while, weren't oh. they? Yeah. And they, they look exactly sense. the same. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that makes perfect sense. 
They oh should be God. together. I forget sometimes that like he's a musician yeah. because he is such like a ridiculous. Yeah, what is he now? He's like I mean, obviously he's still a musician, but now he's also like the judge of a tattoo reality show. Oh I yeah, think. That that's right. Also makes a lot of sense. Absolutely. I mean, I don't even know if that's true or not, but it it doesn't <laughs> matter if it's not. You can see. I it. think it's true, but if it wasn't, like that would still track. Yeah. That would absolutely still track. So I don't have much more to say about this song, so let's talk for a second about the tour that followed the promotion of One Hot Minute, which had its own set of problems that made life as a Red One Hot... One slow hour. Yes. <laughs> it made life as a Red Hot Chili Pepper pretty miserable. So the One Hot Minute tour began with a short European leg before playing across North America, being postponed from the beginning due to Chad Smith suffering an arm injury after a baseball game. Uh, from the start, the band was hit with bad luck when Kiedis broke his leg after tripping over a monitor, engaging in what he referred to as eyes-closed robot dancing. <laughs> <laughs> Though he remained sober throughout the tour, after suffering an additional back injury during a show after attempting to do a backflip, he relapsed into drug usage once again to cope. All the while, Dave Navarro, who very quickly drew, grew tired of touring, was beginning to grate more and more on the band as he too started to spiral into drug usage. Uh, Flea would later remark in an interview that the One Hot Minute tour was one of the most miserable experiences he'd ever had and began to seriously make him rethink being a member of Red Hot Chili Peppers. What? Wow. Speaking of Flea, the moment that I feel like we've all been building up to from oh. the very start. Oh, no. It's time it's for track. Oh, no. It's track number six. <laughs> oh, no. Oof. Titled P. I'm a little P. I mean, here I was complaining that Cadis' lyrics were surface level. <laughs> and here's Flea's solo number about how big redneck yaw dudes aren't shit. <laughs> I mean, if you weren't looking... You gotta turn off the microphones at the end of the night, Rick. Come on. <laughs> I mean, if you weren't looking for a solo showcase for Flea, too bad. That's what you're <laughs> getting bad. here. You got Flea, you got Flea's bass. That's about it. About it. The truly the hubris of, of 90s CD format is that they they just had time to fucking put this bullshit on albums and we like 10 years 10 years prior we would have left something like this off mm. and, and you know would have made a would have gotten the point across a lot better uh than having to listen to flea fucking talk about <laughs> pee yeah <laughs> not that kind of pee no like like the little thing that lives in a pod he swears it's, it's a, a bit vegetable in this song too he, he says some swears yeah he he's... swales <laughs> So it's really bad for little baby's ears. <laughs> <laughs> bad for a baby's ears. So this is a notable song for a few reasons. First, is it? <laughs> <laughs> firstly, you, right, sure. <laughs> firstly, until recent years, this was the only song from One Hot Minute the band would perform in concert after the album tour ended. Secondly, this was one of two songs that Flea prominently contributed to beyond merely writing the bass line. And thirdly, well, because that, because mm. what we just heard. It's a song with a story behind it, too, such as it is, hearkening back to an early time in the Chili Peppers' career when Flea got beat up by randos for having pink hair. Uh, the guitarist, the group's then-guitarist, Hillel Slovak, offered to go beat them up, but Flea said no. <laughs> yeah, hello, really you're awful. like about 86 pounds soaking wet. I, I, I don't need you fighting my battles, big guy. So, this is presenting every possible reason for me to dislike this song. From Flea's bad but leaning into it singing to the very childish and simplistic lyrical content. But at the same time, it's like, yeah, this is what it is. This well, is could what you I expect mean, more? Yeah, by saying, like, this is the perfect example of when you give a bass player too much freedom. <laughs> too much. Too you know, much the freedom. The hubris um, of, of being Michael Balzari. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Michael Balzari. Of the California Balzeris. Did yeah. you know he was actually born in Australia? I did not know that. Yeah. Fun fact. I believe it. Mm-hmm. Anyway, track number seven. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Moving on. Track number seven, titled One Big Mob. One big mob! Oh, yeah, oh, yeah! One big mob! Oh, yeah, oh, yeah! Let's me laugh! Oh, yeah, oh, yeah! Let's me laugh! Oh, yeah, oh, yeah! Oof. 
<laughs> just oh, yeah. that's um, a lot. Nice kungas. Yeah, yeah, that's it's got kung- it. it's got kungas as you call them. <laughs> yeah, I mean that that's technically but what I, they're called. But I feel like this song was put immediately after P to distract people because <laughs> oof, this song. This is this is a dumb dumb song. It's, it's if you took out the words and maybe some of the guitars, like the groove is there, but then with everything else thrown in, it's just like it, it has the same problem that I had with um, uh, track three, uh, deep kick, which is that like it, it, it felt like they're trying to do too much. They're trying to do like too many songs, and it just ended up being too long. Uh, at the end, I think it was another. This is like another six minute track or something. Mm-hmm. Yeah, uh, yeah, it's a long one. Hmm. And yeah, just kind of like few, there's quite a few long ones on this one. Yeah, it's like they're trying to be you know transcendent or like take you through these these different move moods. Mm. Uh, yeah, it just wasn't working for me. Yeah, I would say this is the first one off here that like there's mm. either been there's there's so far been tracks that I've either been just sort of middling about or you know generally liked. This is the first one I outright dislike because it's touching upon everything that I dislike about you know. Pepper, the Chili Peppers at their very er sort of example, mm. like the you know the occasional predilection towards long and directionless jamming, long mm. and directionless psychedelic jamming in this case, drifting back into Jane's addiction territory once again. The meat-headed lyrics, the tendency to fall back into "let's do the fuck" songs, <laughs> the proto new metal rapping—it's all there in this track as a perfect grab bag of things that are really kind of annoying. That's fair. Grab bag is a good way to put it. I mean, it. if there's one thing I could say that I like is, <clears throat> like like we just joked about earlier, there's some neat aux percussion stuff with congas and timbales and tablas at various different times. I still think there's underneath everything a decent groove, but it's, it doesn't excuse the song for yeah, what it is. Yeah, that's fair. I mean, there's a, weird, there's a weird tempo change breakdown near the end after the lines about Timbuktu, kangaroos, <laughs> and a boy named Sue. That's mm-hmm. kind of reminiscent of the same one that they did to close out their cover of Higher Ground, and it's just as superfluous then now as it is then. Yeah. As far as I'd say. I hate that fucking cover. <laughs> 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 I remember, I, and it's weird because I heard that cover before the Stevie Wonder cover, of course, oh, being wow. oh, entrenched in, in rock music, and then... I, I mean, I love the Stevie Wonder original version and love that record. Well, they uh, also butchered Fire by Jimi Hendrix. Oh, God, they did. I, yeah. I, have, I haven't heard that cover, and I can't picture what they could have possibly added it's, to it. it. No, they didn't add. Hmm. <laughs> they covered the germs when I saw them. Uh, actually, Red Hot Chili Peppers was like one of the first big name concerts that I went to. It was them and Foo Fighters. Uh, oh, wow. Blonde Redhead opened. This was in 2000. Wow, Blonde Redhead. That's a that's very weird yeah, opener that, to have. That's a, that's a poll that I haven't heard in a long while. Yeah. Um, and the, the, the set that they played was it's really like, weird. like making a Corner Shop reference. What's that? You don't, you don't remember Corner Shop? Brimful of Asha? No? Right. Okay, moving on. <laughs> Thank you. I don't know anything. They were like a 90s UK indie band made up of uh, British Indian people. Had a song about a Bollywood singer. What was that shit that you were talking about earlier Fuck about ducks? Dungeon ducks or something? <laughs> <What>? Dungeon ducks? <laughs> <laughs> what? Something about ducks. What, what the fuck was it? Oh, I don't even wasn't, remember. We were talking but... about geese. No, we no, no, about... no, no, no. It was like a show, that a cartoon. Oh, duck, duck Dodgers? Duck Dodgers. <laughs> Dungeon ducks. You know. <laughs> <laughs> Dungeon ducks. You know, I mean that does sound like that could have been a really crappy '80s cartoon with yeah. its own toy, like made specifically for a toy line purpose. There, there's no, yeah. there's no English spoken either. They just like all angrily quacking at each other. <laughs> but they're still just like a goofy teen sidekick that's just like, what are we gonna do, Dungeon Ducks? <laughs> uh, oh, okay. Um. <laughs> The Spanish quacksquisition in here. <laughs> I'll get those dungeon ducks one day. <laughs> After I get out of this dungeon <laughs> that they put me in. <laughs> I'll get those dungeon ducks and their deluxe dungeon duck place and now available at KB Toys. <laughs> KB. <laughs> uh, better times. Better times back when we were mindless uh, consumers. Speaking of obscure pulls. <laughs> <sighs> oh, boy. So this song, early contender for least favorite here, I would say. 
That's seems, fair. seems like you guys are kind of. I'm, I'm kind of in if agreement. not in a, if not I mean, in agreement. I, I think P is the worst one. That's the low point of this album is P. But I would agree that this was the this was the first song uh, where I really start to notice the cracks. Hmm. Uh, on this 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 is kind of where it starts to take a downturn for me. All right. So let's move on to track number eight. This one this one is titled Walkabout. You could do it in the city. You could do it in a zone. You could do it in the desert. You could do the unknown on the walkabout. How does the skies are what I spy? So fly. You gotta wonder why. So stop me if this is like, you know, if this is off base, Pat, but I had a feeling you wouldn't like this one very much because in our last episode we recorded, the uh, Leonard Cohen episode, you were very specific that you don't like talk singing. <laughs> I, I kind of like this song. <laughs> sorry, sorry to disappoint. Okay, so that was very off base then. <laughs> well, it's like, I don't know, it's it's rhythmic talk singing is okay. And, and it, it, I guess it's it's not really rapping. I mean, though. yeah. Granted, there is a very sizable difference between Leonard Cohen talk singing and Anthony Kiedis dude bro rapping. Yeah. Yeah. So this song is is kind of more along the lines of Aeroplane, where where it's back in the uh, back in the the sort of funk clean guitar. Yeah, pocket. They're, they're back in their wheelhouse. Yeah, mm-hmm. for sure. And. Uh, I think for the most part, despite the uh, the sort of goofy lyrics and the boop, 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 sort of nature of the vocals, uh, I, I dug this track. Uh, I thought it had a good groove to it. It's a bit long, right? It's a longer one? Yeah, I think so. I think it goes like over five minutes or something like that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I wouldn't say that I don't like this track. It was a perfectly fine, serviceable track for me, but I kept getting like this very sort of trust fundy kind of vibe to it for all like... Because, I mean, this plays into, like, all the sort of pseudo-spiritual bullshit that I was talking about earlier. In my third eye. Yeah, which is to say that it's very standard RHCP fare, more suited towards, like, the kind of college white guy with dreadlocks who can totally hook you up with some green if you spot him some cash for a sobe, brah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> He's got every single beer that he's drank. I mean, what's, what's Anthony, <laughs> what's Anthony, what's Anthony Keita singing about? He's singing about going on a spiritual journey normally undertaken by the Australian Aborigines. Yeah, so... Uh, and he probably hmm. shops at Natural Wonders. <laughs> those Absolutely. Still, those still exist, right? I think yes. so. <laughs> uh, yeah, those, those are those places where you can get those, like, sweet Chinese slippers, right? Yeah. Yeah. Or like those little, used to work or like those, those, or like those little toys where it's just like, oh, it's a big jagged connect looking thing, and then you just, oh, it's really big now. Oh yeah. <laughs> God, what? Yeah, it, it, she worked at one of those places. Uh, Gina did my, work my at fav- the mall. My favorite was always those little sort of, they're like box shaped panels that you can get, and it's literally just a bunch of nails that you stick your hand in, and it makes all sorts oh, of shapes and stuff. Oh, those are great. Oh, I love those. Yeah. Put on your face. Your, oh yeah. That does, that's yeah. the best. Mm-hmm. I got one of those Only later in your life there. do you realize how fucking depraved that probably looks. <laughs> <laughs> like, that's like some fucking Hellraiser type shit right there. It oh, is, yeah. yeah. Definitely. That's Definitely the, look uh, like Pinhead. That's the, uh, that's the uh, intern Cenobite right there. Yeah, there the we go. The guy with Cenobite. one of those little things. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't have that much to say about this track, except I want to draw a little bit of attention to the YouTube video of this song on the RHCP YouTube page where commenter N. Emerson says, props to the guy playing the McDonald's straw. <laughs> okay, that's what I thought guys, I heard. Guys never heard of a Quica before, I guess. <laughs> on, on the whole, I would say it's fine. Yeah, it's fine. It's not great. It's it's grooving. Um, not amazing. Not impressive. They're just plowing through this 60-minute album at this point. And yeah. I was wondering, like, is this because of a contract that they had to come up with a follow-up from Blood Sugar Sex Magic? I don't know. I think that was just, I mean, I want to say that was just the thing during the 90s because okay. like all those biggest 90s albums that you can think of, so many of them just go way over like a typical 40-minute album sort of stuff. Uh-huh. Like this like this goes well over, this goes well o- or close to an hour or so. And thinking back, so did Blood 61 Sugar. 61 minutes, yeah. Thinking back, so did Blood Sugar Sex Magic and probably a lot of other, like, I know Super Unknown by Soundgarden was a really long one. Oh. Uh, 10 by Pearl Jam went really long like that. Yeah, there were a lot of tracks on that. Yeah, yeah. starting around, uh, like, basically 1990, uh, they were starting to move more towards, like, 48 to, like, 
58, 68. I mean, it's probably because albums. compact discs were starting to become way more prevalent than yeah. records at that point. So they were just thinking, like, we have all this extra room. We'd better use all of it or <laughs> it'll go away. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. So they were, you know, that's where we got fucking <laughs> down on the upside was uh, the this last Soundgarden album was, was 16 songs and, and like wow. close to 80 minutes. Oh, boy. Uh, so th- this was released on Warner Brothers. I-, I was trying to figure that out, uh, which label this was released on, because uh, I'm going to quickly do a uh, side story here about their relationship with Mike Patton of Faith No More. <laughs> oh. Have you ever heard about this? I, don't think I had so. not heard about this until I started looking up stuff for One Hot Minute, and you just, like, you just, like, we were talking about it on Slack. You just kind of yeah. mentioned it offhand, and I was just like, that's a thing. I Absolutely. love Slack, by the way. Yeah, Slack's oh, great. Oh, good stuff. So. Uh, f- not Faith No More, but uh, Mike Mr. Patton Bungles. Specific. Mike Patton specifically. Well, so Mike Patton specifically uh, he had, had a beef, or uh, Anthony Kiedis had a beef with Mike Patton. Mike Patton was kind of more like, okay. <laughs> uh, <laughs> it's because he thought like Mike Patton was ripping off his moves in the epic music video. That's exactly what happened, and, and they were, uh, it, it's really funny because like Anthony Kiedis is like very upset about it, and Mike Patton just sort of acts like... I'm like barely a speck of dust on this guy's ass. Like, why is he so concerned? Yeah, and from what I understand, the rest of the band could not give a shit. Right. Wow. It's just Anthony Kiedis who's angry about this. Right. So it's just the moves on the video? Like, it, it was that and like, yeah, just like the sort of the general sound? style yeah. that they right. were going for. Because it was, to be fair, uh, the real thing, uh, which has Epic on it, uh, mm-hmm. came out in 89, uh, which was like the same year as, as Mother's Milk. And they are very, very similar uh-huh. uh, in terms of like production, yeah. but not like in song structure or like general songwriting attitude. They're like very much on different ends of the spectrum. Uh, and Mike Patton kind of comments on that, like Red Hot Chili Peppers are more funk based, funk alternative, and we're kind of more on like the rock metal end of things. Mm. Uh I think, like, it really started to kick off when, like, Californication was released. Yes. Because California, Mr. Bungle's second album, third, was it? Third, third, al- album, third yeah. album. Their last. Yeah. that was Yeah, their third album was due to be released by that point. The same week, and Red Hot Chili Peppers basically got California pushed back so that it wouldn't, like, cause a fuss. Wow. And yep. that really, like, cheesed Mr. Bungle off. Yeah, I mean, so they... Uh, it did cheese them off, and then like they were supposed to, they're supposed to tour together or something like that. Uh, or, or yeah, was that Mr. Bungle? Uh, no, yeah, it was. Uh, were, we, were, were they supposed to tour together? Yeah. So uh, this was like around ninety nine. I had, I had read like they were going to be on the same music festivals a bunch of times. That's what it was. But yeah. Anthony Kiedis like kept on getting them kicked off. So wow. here's, the, here's the quote from Mike Patton. He's a he's a petty little petty little boy. Uh, <laughs> this is Mike Patton from nineteen ninety nine. Says we were looking at booking some Mr. Bungle shows in Europe this past summer. Some big festivals, which is something we've never done before. Uh, we figured it'd be a good thing. We get to play in front of a lot of people. Blah 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 blah. Uh, one of them was in France, one of them was in Holland, it's a big name festival. Uh, uh, our agent was in the process of booking these festivals, and like it turned out that someone was holding a grudge because we were booted off several bills, including a really big festival in Australia, specifically because Anthony Kiedis did not want us on the bill. Uh, Oof. <laughs> he says, that's so pathetic. I mean, this guy's selling a million records. We're not even a speck of dust on this guy's ass. What's the fucking problem? <laughs> <laughs> that's great. <laughs> oh, boy. And then here's a quote from Mike Patton uh, in regards to Anthony Kiedis in 2010. A- a- and the interviewer asks, are, are you friends yet? <laughs> it's not worth talking about. I have no idea what it was about then, and I don't know now. But I bet we'd have a warm embrace if we saw each other now. Mike Patton, Aww. 2010. <laughs> so I just like the leading a happy question. ending. I just like the question leading off with "Are you friends yet?" Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's, it's a little direct, I suppose. Oh boy. Yeah. <laughs> so let's move on to track number nine. This one titled "Tearjerker." I'm feeling sick now. What the fuck am I supposed to do? Just lose a lose. So 
So this being the Red Hot Chili Peppers' dark album, I'm not especially surprised that they're kind of at their best when they're really leaning into the dark subject matter. And you can't really get much darker or sadder than a kind of mournful ballad about Kurt Cobain. His suicide occurred only a few months before the man started recording One Hot Minute, too. That's oh. true, right. Yeah. yeah in, in 94. And they, they, were, they were pals, Anthony Kiedis and Kurt Cobain. Wow. If not for my friends, I might be tempted to name this one the album highlight because it's like subdued, it's almost ethereal, got an atmosphere, and everything else just pops in it as well. Kiedis is still singing very simplistic lyrics, but they're they're delivered in a very solemn sort of way that kind of works a lot better. And Flea and Navarro are adding like very subtle touches to add to the piece. I'll also take a second right here, even though I kind of made a joke about it at the beginning, I got to give a big fucking shout out to Chad Smith. Because like... <laughs> Kiedis, Flea, and Navarro's parts don't always click. Chad Smith is always on point for, like, the entirety of the record. He's the he only is. person who is completely flawless, I would say. <laughs> yeah, Definitely he's, he's underrated. He's a solid drummer. Yeah. 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 He's probably the most consistent player on the record, always keeping the drums on point and adding some real understated grooves to One Hot Minute, Yeah, I would yeah, say. I don't think he was, he was using as much as the other guys, either. Mm. I, or at least I wasn't getting that impression. Uh, the playing on this record in general... Uh, it's keeping into consideration like the the flux or, or like addictions and, and shit that they were all going through. Everyone's playing like fine. Everyone's playing like pretty well. Like no one really sounds sloppy. It, it all True. sounds like right. like they're they're adept at their instruments. Good assessment. I mean, I would hope so. I would hope so. Yeah, they are the, they are the Chili Peppers after all. <laughs> Just come in one day like all right, flea, play some bass. Thunk. So some what? <laughs> <laughs> ah, fuck. <laughs> You're is supposed that, to check that, to make sure. Is that what I do? Is that what this thing around my neck is? <laughs> so it's not made of chocolate? <laughs> He's just all right, I'll, all right, I'll try. My boom, 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 boom. <laughs> like that? No, Flea, not like that at all. <laughs> no, he just starts playing P. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, that's what that was. <laughs> yeah. Guys, we need to reboot Flea. <laughs> factory reset <laughs> <laughs> yeah just hold down the little notch on the back on his back for like five seconds so here's track number 10 this one the title drop right here titled one hot minute <laughs> the title track and it's jane's addiction again yeah yeah pretty much uh yeah we're back into that like kind of straight ahead rock thing on this one mm -hmm. i mean we're kind of back into red hot chili peppers wheelhouse of let's do the fuck songs but mm -hmm. it's still a jane's addiction song just complete with a long-winded psychedelic Wait, breakdown that's what it's, about? it's doing that's... the fuck for one hot minute <laughs> now I mean... i'm concerned <laughs> Complete with a long-winded psychedelic breakdown that's just missing Perry Farrell's dog-attracting primeval shriek. <laughs> dog-attracting. Oh, I don't like Jane's Addiction. Am I being too mean to Perry Farrell? <laughs> no, I, I, I don't I really like mixed, Jane's Addiction. I'm mixed on Perry's voice. I totally get the annoyingness of it, but I think it works for them. That being said, they're they're not one of my top favorite bands. I, I need to check out their albums more. I, I I've I've only really known their 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 hit singles, which I'm not like a huge. Fan I of. will say Perry Farrell does I think legitimately believe in aliens. Oh boy, yeah. Well, that's fair. So okay. yeah, like it's I at mean, least that funny to hmm. to look into. But Perry, I mean, more than anything, I would say Perry Farrell makes some interesting vocal delivery choices. <laughs> like, my favorite one, when they made their little comeback in 2004, their single was a song called Just Because, and there's a big breakdown, complete with a Dave Navarro sort of guitar solo. It just sort of breaks down like... There's a beat, and then Perry Farrell comes back in with... When we first met! <laughs> That sounds accurate. <laughs> oh, goodness gracious. All I right. get the feeling he didn't intend that. I mean, mm. it, it, you just got to capture him in the moment when he's when he's, uh, when he's feeling frisky. Yeah. So I would say this is an <laughs> <laughs> I would say this is another song that's fine but gets really irritating for how much aimless faffing around the band does with it. 
And it's definitely a song that didn't need to be six minutes and 23 Oof. seconds in length. It <laughs> definitely didn't need a nearly minute-long single chord drone near the end. And it definitely didn't need a 20-second <laughs> feedback outro either. Yeah, I yeah. thought this song was like kind of forgettable, uh, especially Agreed. for it being the title track. Now I'm just thinking that like there are peripheral treats like and there's like I have a little bag of it that I'm shaking and that like that gets them all stimulated and gets them singing and like <laughs> catnip type of thing. Yeah, exactly. So he's like a cat. He's a cat person. <laughs> so once again, I don't have much to say about this. So why don't we check back in with the one hot minute tour for a second? The initial still in progress. <laughs> <laughs> still going on to this day. Sometimes when you hear the wind whistle, you can still hear flea. Caterwauling P. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, the, the initial stretch of the One Hot Minute tour lasted from September of 1995 to July of 1996, with much turbulence wow. and band dissatisfaction occurring throughout. The tour did not generate much in the way of new record sales, and sales for One Hot Minute continued to languish. Plans were put into motion to go on a second U.S. tour, a second run of U.S. dates, which would have run through the summer, but they were subsequently canceled after Kiedis was hit with another debilitating injury this time badly breaking his arm in a motorcycle accident. The band would not play another show until an appearance on the David Letterman show at the beginning of the year in 1997. An attempt was made to headline Japan's Fuji Rock Festival that same year, only for the event to be struck with an enormous typhoon, soaking the audience and the band in torrential rain, which made it impossible for them to play their instruments, leading them to close down their set after only eight songs. Damn, that sucks. Yeah, it kind of sucks to be a Red Hot Chili Pepper around that time. (laughs) Yeah, it does. Yeah, Mm -hmm. I mean, your sock is going to be soaked. (laughs) Your one sock. Your one sock. It's nothing worse than wet socks. (laughs) So musty. All right. Moving on, let's go on to track number 11, titled Falling Into Grace. And when we get in the same place, at the same time, it is your grace that I want to fall right into now. You love the proud. I'm falling into grace with you. I'm falling into good. Kind of resembles breaking the girl a little bit. And I guess I like the guitar atmospherics that Navarro's doing. There's a lot of talk box and feedback-centric sections that work a lot better here than they did on One Hot Minute. But once again, it's just kind of fine. This one's okay. I think it's got a really strong verse to it, actually. And oh, a, yeah? st- a pretty strong, catchy chorus. I agree. Yeah, I, I actually I dug the choruses in this. I, I thought they worked. Uh, everyone's doing their thing, and, and uh, it, it was engaging. Yeah, mm. more engaging than um, One Hot Minute, for sure. Oh, definitely, mm. yeah. Yeah, I, I can agree with you on that. I thought some of the, uh, some once again, falling back into those pseudo-spiritual references to, like, mm-hmm. Buddhist singing bowls and, and uh, gurumukh. I'm not sure if mm-hmm. I'm pronouncing that right. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with being spiritual, but it rings really weird and hollow when I hear Anthony Kiedis singing about it. Yeah. Considering how much it's balanced out with more do the fuck lyrics. It's just, it's more <laughs> trust fund hippie territory for me. That's fair. Yeah. I, 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 I don't I'm, know what I'm, to tell you. Yeah, I, I can definitely see that. We're, we're getting towards the end of this record, too. Yeah, we've only got a couple more tracks to go at this point. <laughs> we're, on, uh, we're on the home stretch, baby. <laughs> yeah, not much to say about this song, so we won't say much. Uh, so let's move on to track number 12. Uh, this one titled, Shallow Be Thy Game. Fucking way, way to fucking make me feel guilty about calling him a lack of spiritual trust fund hippie. Now you just take this moment to pull out your anti-religion song. <laughs> I guess oh, I didn't boy. pay too close attention to the lyrics. Yeah, it's a it's a song critical specifically of missionaries. Like uh-huh. like specifically, it's a song critical of missionaries who go into uh, Aborigines cultures and try to enforce their own sort of spirituality onto it. Actually, uh-huh. yeah, pretty. Uh... Pretty radical thinking yeah. on his part. I mean, I mean, those, not, I mean, not radical thinking, but like, I I can't give Kitas too much credit though because it's every bit as surface level as the rest of Kitas's stuff. He wrote with, a pamphlet with lyrics like <laughs> Mis- "Missionary madness sweep up culture with a broom, trashing ancient ways is par for the course. It's fucking rude, <laughs> guys." <laughs> It's rude. It's rude. It's, it's rude. It's so rude to get these aboriginals hooked on alcohol so it totally damages their community and, and breaks them up and uh, 
It's so Destroys rude. Destroys their culture it's from so the inside the out. Way, the way people will just force their way in and colonize. <laughs> yeah. You know. It's- a, it, rude is the perfect thousand, description of a multi-thousand year old religion a multi-thousand year old civilization and push them to the brink of extinction yeah. <laughs> so this this was the fourth single from the album but only in Australia where it was released for promotional purposes it's the only single from the album where no music video was created and like the rest of One Hot Minute it was not performed live since 1996 wow this was a single? yeah I had no idea in yeah. fact of the songs on One Hot Minute only a handful were ever played past the 1990s <laughs> the most frequent unfortunately being P. Because <laughs> it's just Flea, really. Yeah. yeah, and that's when, like, the band is, is taking a shit or whatever. <laughs> yeah. I really thought that this song, like, could have been a B-side. You, you could have left this off. There just wasn't, like, they weren't doing anything new uh, that, like, mm-hmm. I haven't I already heard you know, on better tracks. So yeah. I, I feel like they could have locked this one off. I, I'm very surprised to hear that it was a single mm-hmm. anywhere. But like I said, free, like, not free. P was the most frequently paid play. Can't talk today. All good. P was the most frequently played past the 1990s, followed by Aeroplane, while Warped and One Big Mob were only ever played once during the aughts. Wow. The tracks Tearjerker, Falling Into Grace, and the title track One Hot Minute have never been performed live, while all the rest were never played again until after 1997, at least according to setlist.fm. Wow. Yeah. So they really weren't that interested in acknowledging this album for the longest time. I don't think... When I saw them, I don't. I don't think they played anything off of One Hot Minute. I think. Mo- think I think it's only been like most recently that they've started re-adding like Aeroplane and Warped back into their set list and stuff. Yeah, like I that. think I have seen Warped on, and I've seen One Big Mob on their set lists too. Flea actually is the one who writes the set list for every show. Oh, neat. Yeah. So he decides like the the whole thing. Wow. Yeah. He's yeah, got Flea the does. pencil and the paper. Yeah, and his handwriting is very interesting. It's almost illegible, but it's still kind of cool. Is that why they always have P for the encore? Because <laughs> he just d- writes P. And the second encore. <laughs> yeah, because he wrote it. Yeah. <laughs> and the third, third encore. Just writes P in big letters. <laughs> P-E-A. <laughs> uh, I mean, apart from all that, it's very sort of par for the course Red Hot Chili Peppers right here. I hate to keep saying that over and over, but for the most part, it's just been a consistent album. It's just been a consistently okay album, I'd say. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, here's the last track. (laughs) Finally, we reach track number 13, titled Transcending. You are my god, you are my dog, you get me close, love never lost. I called you here, but you said fuck off. Said your brother's a real pawn. Something gonna happen, or something bad will soon. Transcending flesh could be a breeze. This is just half of the equation, of course, because much later in the song, it turns into this. One more Jane's Addiction ripoff into there. Right. Yeah, they had to get one more, like, uh, of that same exact tempo. (laughs) (laughs) So so we're at the final track. We find another tribute track. This one, as we mentioned earlier, this is the one that's paying tribute to River Phoenix. Yes. Who was also a friend of Kita's who lost his life to a drug overdose. I mentioned earlier this album tends to shine when it gets into really darker territory in terms of lyric and mood. And I feel like this track is no exception until it gets to the heavier part. Yeah I, yeah, I really liked the, the first half of it, and then, yeah, like you said, it, uh, it, it definitely kind of loses the plot and goes back into, like, too familiar territory. Mm-hmm. But this is a really weird uh, last track to have on an album mm-hmm. this long. It mm-hmm. felt just, it just felt like it kind of ends. I will say that I kind of like Navarro's guitar playing on this one, because very frequently he has a tendency to like get really showboaty with it yeah but on this one he's actually like contributing to an atmosphere and all right. that sort of stuff i don't know i thought it was decent so before we get to our final thoughts let's just close out the timeline of the album with the true end of this saga the firing of dave navarro Ooh. after the embarrassment that was the fuji rock festival the band parted ways once again not regrouping until 1998 to write and rehearse new songs by this point, Kiedis was struggling with remaining clean, but Navarro had drifted even deeper into drug dependency. The rest of the band decided it was necessary for Navarro to go into rehab and attempted to convince him to do so. But the discussion very quickly turned into a dispute, ending with Navarro falling over an amplifier in a daze. Ooh. Oh, whoops. <laughs> 
they fired him not long after that, and it wasn't long before, like, it wasn't long before they fired him, which enraged him at first and left the band on the verge of disbanding. What ultimately kept the band together, however, was Flea made one last-ditch effort to bring uh, guitarist John Frusciante back into the group. Frusciante had recently completed rehab of his own and was all too happy to rejoin. So, happy ending. Kind of. Kind of. Yeah. So let's get to our final thoughts. Uh, Pat, do you consider this album to be a worst of all time album? Absolutely not. Uh, in fact, this is my favorite Red Hot Chili Peppers album. Ooh, wow. wow. Uh, yes, I, I, I really, I, I, I dug the vibe. I thought it worked. Uh, and I also just weirdly am attached to this album simply about uh, because of when it came out. Uh, it, so I just have some like weird nostalgia tied to it. it, it it's a good example of a dark horse album uh from a band who honestly isn't as bad as as some people make them out to be i think uh they're not great they're not my favorite band uh by any stretch and i definitely am annoyed by like a good chunk of their output but Mm -hmm. uh i also really appreciate that i i tend to find at least like one or two songs on every album they've put out that i enjoy and I actually really liked quite a few. Uh, I would say like at least half of this record uh, are, are like pretty solid songs to me. Hmm. Uh, Kat, do you consider this a worst of all time album? For them? Uh, just in general. No, I wouldn't say of all time in general. However, well, I can't even say it's their worst because their later stuff is just... Yeah, I haven't heard any of their newest stuff with, like, Josh Klinghoffer, but I've heard mm-hmm. it's not that great. Yeah, so I, I can't even call this their worst album either, either but um, it's it's got my favorite track on it, you know? Mm. I, and this is one of those um, albums I can just put on in the car, and I don't have to think about his lyrics, because I don't, <laughs> you know? You can just tune yeah, out the lyrics. Yeah, it's best that you don't. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, and I can just kind of, yeah, I can groove to the psychedelic stuff to, like, tune out. And then, yeah. then I, you know, put more intelligent music on when I want to think. Hmm. I would say whether it's a worst of all time, that gets a solid no from me as well. I wouldn't necessarily consider this to be a great album. No. It's a good album. I wouldn't say it's a high-tier Red Hot Chili Peppers album either, based on what little I know about the band's music. But it's it's underrated in its own way, and all the flack it re- it's received seems pretty much just to be on the back of other people's expectations as they related to the massive success of Blood Sugar Sex Magic. Mm-hmm. Besides, they take that darker and more insular sound and, in my opinion, really refine it on my favorite album of theirs, Bla- or is, uh, 2002's By The Way, mm-hmm. and then they'll only to immediately throw it out the window with Stadium Arcadium in 2006. <laughs> And yeah. fall ri- and fall right back into let's do the fuck but in California songs. Mm-hmm. Only now they're just a little too middle aged to still be singing about that. Let's yeah. let's slowly do the yeah. fuck and only once and like don't bother me until yeah. like Sunday. And then we'll put Leno on. <laughs> then we'll put Leno. <laughs> I mean, if nothing else, it led to what I consider to be the greatest Red Hot Chili Pepper song of all time. <laughs> You know, Red Hot Chili Peppers. <laughs> That's all of them. Yes. <laughs> At the same time. <laughs> It, this is the new so there's like was, a new joint version of, of the band that has all of the guitarists yes including Hello Slovak yes. somehow that was uh, that was Abracadabra Lafornia right I forget the name of the comedian but he basically put it out during a Super Bowl basically just sort of releasing it as a fake demo of a new Red Hot Chili Peppers song <laughs> yeah. and people fell for it yeah John Daly that's who it was John Daly oh my goodness I mean I believed it yeah. Oh, boy. I'd never heard that before. That's hilarious. <laughs> and then he later put one out. To, then he later put out a fake <laughs> diss track to uh, Lil Pump, I think. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah. Where he basically just sort of rapped as Lil Pump's dad. <laughs> You're in big trouble, mister. So, uh, Pat, what would you say is your favorite track from the album? So, I, I kind of made that Or at least cl- bad. I kind of made that clear before uh, that I really love Warped. Uh Coffee Shop is a close second, uh, just because like I haven't heard it as much, uh, and I really just kind of dug whatever was going on there. Uh, 
Yeah, and I just I have like a lot of strong nostalgic ties to to this song and, and like seeing the video on TV. It kind of came out around the same time as shit like uh, Allison Chains's uh, self titled album and like Tiny Music by STP and just like oh. all these other records that I like really fucking loved around that specific time frame. And uh, yeah, it was just it was kind of like a welcome addition to 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 that. Uh, uh, you know, that that particular pocket of time mm-hmm. uh, and yeah I, I feel like warped was just like them really taking this partnership with dave navarro and, and like really doing the best that they probably it, it was like yeah. the most successful right. instance of having these musicians all in one room and like you said to yeah. the point where like i'm not missing perry farrell at all like yeah. it, uh Kiedis is actually like fucking killing it, and right. and it's funny because those are not the two best vocalists out not there in all. rock and roll. But <laughs> but it was really well produced, and like I, I like I said, I kind of liked the I really liked the delay and, and like the out of time, out of phase vocals that he was putting on, and it, it, it gave it a very psychedelic vibe, and, and it works for what he what his style of vocal is. Mm-hmm. Uh, it, it just mm-hmm. like totally worked, and it was it was like a little bit pushed back too, and not quite up front. Right, uh, and uh, being used more uh, like an instrument in the in the in the whole piece. Mm. Uh, same question to you, Cat. What was your favorite or least bad song? Aeroplane. <laughs> All right, um, asked and answered. Yeah, best bass line. I love it so much. Uh, my favorite was my friends. Yes, uh, Pat. What would you say is the worst track on the album? Ooh, uh, I'm tempted tempted to say P, but just for uh, the sake of being interesting, I'm going to go with one big mob. Uh, just because that was the song that, like, I really, I, I could see where the, where there's some some flaws and cracks mm. happening, and, and I was just like, I was, it was boring. It just bored me. I, I wanted it to be shorter than it was, and it, it like it didn't need to be as drawn out. Uh, same question to you, Cat. What was your least favorite? I have a feeling I know what it yeah, is. Yeah, it's definitely P. <laughs> <laughs> definitely P. So we've already gone into that. <laughs> uh, my least favorite was also one big mob. Pat and I are in the hand-holding See, club on that one. I didn't even one. think Yay. that was that bad. Really? Yeah. At least I that mean, one I can kind of tune out to. And I mean, it was the worst on the album. I I mean, that, I oh, openly yeah, oh, disliked yeah, it. Oh, yeah, it was really bad. Yeah, I mean, I disliked it. It was just more embarrassing for me than right. anything else. That makes sense. P was and, a close second. Yeah. <laughs> and that is One Hot Minute. Thank you very much for being on the yeah, program. Thank thanks for having me. Yeah, thank you for, yeah. for coming out here. And I, I know you're 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 uh, very busy these days. Yeah. And uh, definitely appreciate you making the time to come out. My uh, pleasure. What you, yeah, what do you got going on? What, yeah. what are you up oh, yeah. to? So I am playing uh, Shelter Fest tonight. And that's up in Beverly at a church. It's a fundraiser for the homeless of Beverly. So if you're listening now, go back in time <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and go to Beverly and check Cat out. Or or there's March 22nd. Um, I think the knockups are playing. I'm looking at my calendar to make sure. March 22nd, where the knockups are playing the Midway. Awesome. Very yeah, cool. JP. Yeah. yeah, go check out the knockups. Go check out uh, Salem Wolves. Go check out. The other band you mentioned, uh, Dick Picks. <laughs> the Dick Picks. <laughs> that's um, it, right? That. that uh... Yeah, I mean the Dick Picks. We're not active right now, um, so it's really just knock up Salem Wolves, and then like I do, I think I might be doing a cover. <laughs> funny story, a cover set of Chili Peppers songs. Yeah. Um, wow. Finally, my entire life, I Very think cool. I've always wanted to do something live with the Chili Peppers and never have. So now it's myself, it's Ashley Rhodes of Lockett, it's mm-hmm. Polly from. Marianne Toilet and Guia Teenagers, and it's Nini from Ski Bunny. Oh yeah, Nini. Mm. Yeah, yeah. So and Very we're cool. we're we're actually working on a vocalist. We have someone coming in to see if we can make that work too. So it'll be fun. It's just like a one-off gig for fun in and, August. And it's all girls too, right? That's great. Um, well, Polly's a, a oh guy. Polly, yeah, mm. drummer. No, Very all good. Cool. But mostly women. Hmm. Uh, you got anything to plug, Pat? Uh, I don't know. I got a new Smell album out now. So uh, good. So it's called Viva Lasagna. It is the sophomore release. Uh, Wrote it and recorded it all within the month of February for the RPM project. Yay. Thank you. You both did great on it. Yes, and and Lil did did a great job, and uh, I'm sure they'll plug it next. Uh, But yeah, check it out. It's on Spotify. It's on uh, iTunes, Apple Music maybe, uh, Bandcamp, uh, YouTube. That's a Y O U T U B E. 
dot com. Uh, all this time I've been spelling it Y O O T O O B. I thought See, it was just the letter U. Yeah, I thought it was me tube, like referring to me. <laughs> <laughs> um, what have I got uh, for the RPM challenge? I did an album of uh, video game music for a video game that doesn't exist uh, under the name Mithril Edge. Uh, the album is called Endless Elegy OST Disc One. Maybe there'll be a disc two. But you can check that out on my uh, Sawtooth page on Bandcamp, djsawtooth.bandcamp.com. And uh, recently announced a whole bunch of DJ gigs recently. Uh, so go check that out on the Sawtooth Facebook page. And that's what I, that's all I got for now. It's dropping plates. And that about does it for this episode of Jukebox Zeros. Our theme song is Sunny Day by the band Froggy and the Friendship. Uh, you can check them out at froggyandthefriendship.bandcamp.com. If you got an album you want to suggest for us to review or just want to leave us some feedback or a comment, email us at jukeboxzeros_podcast at gmail.com. You can find us on facebook.com at facebook.com slash jukeboxzeros_podcast or on Twitter at twitter.com slash jukeboxzeros. You can find us, rate us, review us, and subscribe to us on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, and now Spotify. And check out our archive main page at Spreaker.com slash show. <clears throat> Once again, at Spreaker.com slash show slash jukebox dash zeros. Jukebox Zeros is a production of the Zero Science Network. For more great podcasts, go check out zero dash science.com. And that about does it for this episode of Jukebox Zeros. I'm Lils. I'm Patrick. I'm Kat. And remember. Uh, that didn't work out at all. <laughs> Good night. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry.